So now we are on to chapter 23, and this has to do with how populations evolve. So we kind of touched on some of that in the last chapter. Um, so one thing that I kept bringing home in that last chapter was how a misconception about evolution is that it's just organisms that are evolving. However, it's populations that are evolving, and that process is what we're going to talk about in this chapter. Um, so I know this is shocking, but population genetics studies changes genetically in a population. Amazing. Um, so one thing that we're going to actually have a lab on that we're going to play a game with is going to be what's called microevolution. So micro means on a small scale, and so when you talk about microevolution, that is looking at how a gene pool changes from one generation to the next. So I'm pretty sure you're aware that evolution is something that happens over thousands to millions of years, and microevolution is looking at things that are going from one generation to the next. <clears throat> so obviously that's going to be important because if we want to understand how a population is evolving, we need to look at the little pieces and then put it all together. So a couple of definitions that we need to go over. First of all, the gene pool. Um, the gene pool is going to be all of the alleles that are found in a population at a time. So that's a word from Bio 111. So just to review, um, an allele is an alternative form of a gene, right? So like with eye color, you could have the big B or the little B, and those would be your alleles. <clears throat> um, another thing that we want to define is going to be a species. So a species is going to be a group of individuals that can interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring. So um, those words are going to come up, come up a lot because a species is going to be the unit of evolution. And basically when we have a new species, that evolved from another one. Um, the last term is um, when we say that a population or an allele is fixed in a population. And what that means is that that allele doesn't really go away and come back or anything like that. So like think about like how um, we have skin, right? There's an allele that's coding for that, but are probably multiple alleles, but those are permanent. It's not like, you know, you go, oh, I hope my baby doesn't get a uh, homozygous recessive and have no skin, right? So that's kind of what we're talking about with fixed. Those are things that um, aren't really going to change in a population because they're necessary for that population to be successful. So fixed alleles are going to be ones that we don't really concentrate on that much when we look at population evolution just because they're not really going to change that much. And if they do, that's obviously major, but we're looking at other things. Okay. So what we're going to do is a little bit of math, and um, what we're going to do is just, um, if you're filling in your notes, I'm not going to scroll down so we can kind of allow you to think for these next couple things. So <clears throat> if you look down here at the bottom, I say that we're going to look at a population of 500 individuals. Now, if you remember, alleles are going to, um, there's going to be two alleles usually for some sort of character. And so um, if we have 500 individuals and we're looking at one type of gene, that means we're going to have 1,000 total alleles because each individual has two alleles. Hopefully that makes sense. So now what we're going to do is try and calculate how many dominant alleles are in a population and how many recessive alleles are in a population. So if we have 500 total, we said that's going to be 1,000. Oops, I dropped my numbers. Okay. Um, let's say that we have 320 that are big R, big R. So how many big R alleles are in that little population? Well, if we have 320 of one of the big R's and 320 of the other, that means we're going to have a total of 640 big R's in that little section of the population. So if we scroll down here, there we go. We've got our 640. Now the next one, 160 individuals are big R, little r. So that means we're going to have 160 of the big R's and 160 of the little R's. So that's that next line that you see right there. And then the last part, we have 20 individuals that are little r, little r. So how many little r alleles are in that population? We would say 40, right? Because we've got 20 of one little r and 20 of another little r. So that gives us 40. So now what we need to do is just figure out how many total big R alleles there are in this population and how many little ones there are. And we end up with taking 640 plus 160, and that gives us 800 for the big R allele. So we have the 640 here and the 160 here. That's the only place that we have the big R allele. And then for the other one, we just do 160 plus 40, and there's our 160 there and our... Um, Oops, sorry, 160 there and our 40 there, and that's where we get our 200 little r alleles. So then we can divide that by the total alleles, and that gives us a frequency. 
Now, a way that you can check is make sure that they equal 100%, right? Now, the reason we're looking at this is because this is how you can tell if a population is evolving from one generation to the next without seeing something major physically happening. <clears throat> so, if we did our initial survey of this um, group of plants or whatever it is, let's say that it started out at 80 and 20. And let's say we come back in a couple of years and there's been a couple of generations and now the big R allele frequency has gone up to 82% and the little r allele has gone down to 18%. We can say that population has evolved because the allele numbers have changed. Okay, so anytime allele numbers are changing, evolution is happening. Okay, so if we scroll down a little bit further, we probably should talk about what can cause allele frequencies to change. So there are two scientists called Hardy and Weinberg. I'll scroll this up a little bit more. And they started to look at allele frequencies in a population and try to figure out how this all works. And they came up with their principle, which says the frequency of alleles and genotypes, so that's just genes, right, in a population remain constant over generations. So those percents will not change unless they are acted upon by agents other than segregation and recombination. So if you remember, segregation is just one of the natural things that happens in meiosis that allows some eggs to go in one way and some, egg, or some chromosomes to go in one egg and chromosomes to go in another egg. And then recombination is where the crossing over and all of that happens. If those are the only two things happening to a population as far as allele frequency goes, allele frequencies will stay the same. So, if that's happening, we can say a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And what that means is, even with all this shuffling going on with those two forces that we talked about, even if those are the only ones, then a population is going to be in equilibrium, and that means that the allele frequencies will not change. <clears throat> now, in order for that to be true, there are five conditions that have to be met for that population. So, the first one is that the population size has to be very large. Now, obviously, that's going to be different if you're talking about ants versus elephants or something like that. The numbers are going to be different, but very large is going to be important. You cannot have a small population. Um, next thing is that random mating is occurring. And so what that means is that you have to not really be able to see a pattern on who is mating with who. The third thing is no mutation can happen, so the DNA has to remain intact. There can't be any substitutions, deletions, anything like that. Fourth thing is that there cannot be migration of genes from other sources. That's called gene flow. So you can't have genes coming in from one population and organisms mixing with these two populations. It kind of has to be isolated. And then the last part is that there can be no natural selection. So no one can have an advantage over anyone else. So hopefully that's sending up some red flags to you because that's very rare, if not impossible, in nature for all of these five things to work. So what does that say to you? That should say to you that if either any of these are violated, then evolution is happening. That's basically it. So they came up with an equation to figure out allele frequencies in a population, and then you could come back and look at those frequencies and see if this population is evolving. So this is the equation right here, and I'm just going to show it to you briefly here because we're actually going to do this in lab next week where we're actually going to take all of these apart and look at the um, actual calculations. So does this work in nature? No. And every time you deviate from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, that's when you end up with evolution happening. In the next video, I'm going to talk about why allele frequencies change and what that means is how the Hardy-Weinberg um, conditions can be violated.